Chapter 15 of The Exploits of Juve by Marcella Lane and Pierre Suvestra. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 The Simplon Express Disaster. While Lupart and his mates were making off across country, the disaster occurred. At a curve in the track, the Simplon Express, coming at full speed, charged the cars and crushed them. Then, lifted by the shock, the engine reared backward on its wheels and fell heavily, dragging down in its fall a baggage car and the first two carriages coupled behind it. Then rose in the night cries of terror and the frantic rush of the passengers who fled from the luxurious train. Fandor picked himself up and went forward. From the tender of the engine a cloud of steam escaped with hoarse whistlings. The driver held out his two broken arms. "'Give me a hand, for God's sake! Open the tap! There, that hoisted bar! Lift it up! Quick, the boiler's going to burst!' Fandor was still engaged in carrying out this maneuver when Sucker began to arrive. The stoker, less seriously hurt than the driver, had managed to drag himself clear of the wreckage which was beginning to catch fire. The head guard, and those passengers whose seats had been at the rear of the train, hurried up and the combined effort at rescue began. They searched for the injured and put out the incipient blazes. Instinctively, those who had fled from the train followed in a frantic stampede the road at the foot of the embankment, reaching Verez village out of breath and gave the alarm. The countryside was soon in an uproar. Lights flashed, torches and lamps of vehicles harnessed in haste. A quarter of an hour after the disaster, half the neighborhood was afoot from all quarters. A bit of luck, sir, remarked the conductor, still pallid with horror, to Fandor, that the collision happened at the curve where our speed was slackened. Ten minutes sooner, and all the carriages would have been telescoped. Yes, it was luck, replied the journalist, as he wiped his face, covered with soot and coal dust. The two carriages telescoped were almost empty. From a neighboring way station, the railway officials had telephoned news of the accident. The section of line was kept clear by telegraph. Word came that a relief train was being made up and would arrive in an hour. Fandor had quickly regained his coolness and was one of the first to lend a hand in the rescue, turning over the wreckage and setting free the injured. As he passed along the track, he was attracted by the appeals of a stout man who hurried toward him, wailing, Sir, sir, what a terrible calamity! Fandor recognized his fellow passenger, Josephine's lover. Yes, and we had a lucky escape. But what has become of your wife? In using the word wife, Fandor was under no illusion. He merely wanted to interview the other. My wife? Ah, sir, that's the terrible part of it. She's not my wife. She's a little friend. And now it's all bound to come out. My lawful wife will hear everything. As for the girl, I don't know what has become of her. She knew that you were carrying money? Yes, sir. I am an agent for wines at Bercy, and was going to pay over dividends to stockholders. One hundred and fifty thousand francs. I recognized one of the men among the robbers, a cooper. He knew that every month I travel carrying large sums of money. I am quite sure this robbery was planned beforehand. And who are you, sir? Monsieur Martai, of Kessler and Barry's. Fortunately, the money is not lost. Not lost? You know where to find the robbers? That I do not. But they have only the halves of the notes. They are worth nothing to them unless they can lay their hands on the corresponding halves. It's a way of cheap insurance. And where are the other halves of the note? Oh, in a safe place, in the office of the firm at Bercy. Fandor abruptly left Monsieur Martai and approached an official. When will the line be cleared? In an hour's time, sir. There will be no train for Paris till then? No, sir. Fandor moved off along the trap. That's all right. I can make it. I'll have time to send a wire to the capital. The journalist sat down on the grass, took out his writing pad, and began his article. But he had overrated his strength. He was worn out body and soul. He had not been writing ten minutes when he dropped into a doze, the pencil slipped from his fingers, and he was fast asleep. When Fandor opened his eyes, the twilight was beginning to come down. It was between five and six o'clock. "'What a fool I've been! I've made a mess of the whole business now!' he cried, as he ran frantically to the nearest station. "'How soon the first train to Paris?' "'In two minutes, sir. It is signaled.' "'When does it arrive?' "'At ten o'clock.' 
Fandor threw up his hands. I shall be too late. I haven't time to wire Juve and warn him. Oh, what an idiot I was to sleep like that. End of chapter 15